Okay, we're doing another video here on uh, category theory. Um, this one is taking a step back from the video I did last time, which was on co-products and products. We're just going to talk about objects and morphisms. Um, these are pretty simple, but you know, if if you if you approach it from the <laughs> from the wrong direction, it it can get pretty. Uh, I don't know. The whole thing can get pretty abstract quickly. So. Um, I'm going to kind of define these in my own words, okay? An object, I'm going to be very unscientific here. It's just a thing with some qualities, okay? Uh, let's think of a couple of these real fast, like a house. You know what a house looks like. You know what a house is. You probably don't define it in your head every time, but every time that you think of a house, you're immediately associating some things with that house. If you drive down the street, you, know, you, you see a series of buildings, you can tell which ones are houses and which ones are uh, gas stations, etc., etc. Um, so this is an object, and, and the structure, when we think of the structure, we're talking about these qualities, okay? This is what I mean when I say the word structure. I'm talking about these abstract qualities that make that object that object, okay? Dog, that's another object. A car, that's an object, right? And you could think of some things about cars or dogs. Um, when, you, when you say the word, you picture a dog, and you're picturing a lot of the qualities that make a dog a dog. A morphism, a morphism, uh, is um, it's a map between objects that preserves the structure. Okay? And we'll get into some examples of this. And maybe I'll give some... These are some normal examples. Uh, here's some math examples. Okay. A group, if you know what a group is. A ring. A set. A topological space. Um, things like that. Okay, And their morphisms would be a group homomorphism, a ring homomorphism, a set function, etc., etc. So let's expand on this example of a house. Okay? I'm going to write out, I'm going to pause the video, I'm going to write out a few things that I think make a house a house. Uh, and uh, we'll talk. Okay, so I've, I've listed three things. This is actually kind of an interesting thought experiment. Um, when you start thinking about objects you know, anything that you can think of really, um, you abstract it in your mind. Okay? And when you think of house, you think of certain things that make it a house. And I picked three. You could probably do better if you sat there and thought about it. But this is enough, I think, to continue. So it's definitely a building. Okay, I'm going to kind of group this here. Um, its purpose is to be endowed with one household. Okay, so we're not talking about a multifam. This would separate it from like an apartment building. We're talking about a place where one family lives. Okay, Um or where one family is supposed to live, right? Um, and there's some bathrooms and some bedrooms in this house. And there's probably a few other things that you can think of that when you see a house, you immediately think, oh, that's a house, right? Um, but I think this is enough just for example. Um, so in this case, a morphism, a house morphism is what we'll call this. House morphism. is anything that can be done to the house that keeps it a house. So here's the most obvious, obvious example. Do nothing to the house. It's still a house, right? Um, that would be like the identity map, okay? You're just returning the same house that you started with. Um, let's say Chip and Joanna Gaines come to town, and they're going to fix up your house. You're going to take that house, you're going to take your house, and they are going to, Chip and Joanna are going to make it a cooler house. So they're taking house one, sending it to house two. The point here is, 
House 2 is still a house. It's still a building. Its purpose is still to be endowed with one household, and it still has bathrooms and bedrooms. They may have changed the roof. They may have painted the exterior. They may have put up some shiplap. They love that shiplap. Um, but in the end, you still have a house. So Chip and Joanna Gaines acting on your house, that's a house morphism. Something that wouldn't be a house morphism is if you took a house and you turned it into a church, right? Or if you took a house, that's not a morphism. This is not a house morphism. Or if you took a house and you turned it into a, 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 a store, right? That's not a house morphism. The point here is you're taking your object and the abstraction that comes with your object, all the things that make your object that object, and you're keeping that. Okay, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, mathy stuff for a second here, um, but not super mathy, just kind of going over what you might see in an undergraduate algebra course. Okay, so you just signed up for an undergrad algebra course called X Theory, and uh, you're taking this course with Dr. Dingle, and what Dr. Dingle is going to do is he's going to start by defining what an X is. Okay, and then what he's going to do is he's going to tell you about X morphisms. This is like class two, maybe class one. You're, you know, you're talking about X's and you're giving examples, you know, uh, and then you talk about X morphisms, and then you inevitably talk about the X isomorphism theorems. Okay. And then the question becomes, well, how do we make more X's from the X's we already know? And you start thinking about things like sub X's. And you think about things like products. And you think about things like quotients. And uh, then you do funky stuff for the rest of the term. Every single algebra course you take is going to take this form, uh, in undergrad at least. And what you really want to focus on is this stuff here, okay? When I say X, I'm talking about an object. And the structure of that object, what makes that object that object, is the definition, okay? So if I'm talking about vector spaces, you learn the definition. There's like eight things you have to check. Um, they're actually embedded in groups and rings and modules, which are other objects that you can study. You, there are, you know, you can take, sorry, you can study module theory, you can study ring theory, you could study group theory, you could study uh, lots of things. Um, but this is the basic structure of that class, okay? Um, and as you take, you know, the first class you take like this, if you haven't taken a class, it all seems pretty new, but by the third or fourth class, you're starting to think to yourself, dudes, you're just doing the same thing over and over again. And there's a good reason for that, right? Like, these are tried and true ways of building new X's, okay? Um, but they're the same exact thing. I, 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 I shouldn't say exact. It's the same idea, okay? Products, for instance. What's a product of groups? Well, you take two groups and you glue them together. Okay, topologies. What's a product of topologies? Well, you take two topologies and you glue them together. Okay, what about vector spaces? What, what is, that? is that? Surely that's different. Well, yeah, that's different. You're going to take two vector spaces and you're going to glue them together, right? Quotients, okay? Uh, group quotients, well, you take a normal subgroup and you send it to zero. Okay, what about topologies? Oh, you take a subspace, you send it to zero. Vector spaces? Ah, yeah, you, you take a sub-vector space, you send it to zero. Okay, it's the, same, it's the same idea every single time. And that's where we get this idea of these universal properties. Universal properties. That work uh, no matter what object you're talking about. No matter what category you're talking about. Okay? And so there are objects that are of mathematical interest, and I mentioned a few of them already. Sets are some of them. Uh, topological spaces. Groups. 
uh, rings, you know, there's plenty that you could think of if you sat there and, and did them. And I'll, I'll go over just a couple of these in a second and talk about the morphisms in the same sense that we talked about the house morphism. But for now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of very roughly define what a category is. A category is a collection of objects along with uh, their morphisms. Okay, so these are two separate things, and the, the morphisms of those objects. Okay, so for instance, set. That is a category. But we don't just talk about sets when we're talking about categories. We're talking about sets and all of the morphisms of sets, topologies. Same thing. We're talking about uh, or topological spaces. We're talking about topological spaces and the morphisms between them. Groups, uh, rings, the same thing. Okay, so we'll pause for a second. We'll, we'll get a little more uh, mathy than the house example. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and maybe I'll add one more benign example in there as well. Okay, so the first one is uh, set. This is a pretty easy one. The structure of a set, you know, when you think of a set, what do you think about? You think about a collection of elements, right? Um, that's easy, right? Any collection of elements, that's a set. The morphisms of a set are any maps that take a set and send it to a set. These are just set functions. Okay? Any set function you can think of, that's a morphism of a set. Okay, top topological spaces. These are spaces um, that allow for things like limits and stuff like that. I won't get too into this. You could spend a lot of time looking at that if you wanted to. But we'll just say they're, they're really nice spaces. Okay? And uh, they have rules. They have rules that we're not going to mention here. Um, and, and the morphisms here are going to be uh, continuous functions, and there's a reason I brought this up here, okay? Um, continuous functions are going to keep the rules the same. That's the reason this is a morphism. So if you start with a space, and let's just give a really crappy example here. Let's say I start with this circle, and pretend we're dealing with everything inside this circle. Here's an example of a morphism. Okay, that look, that's a morphism. Why? Because I can take an open set here, and I can figure out where it came from over here. Here's an example of something that's not a morphism. Okay? I'm talking about this is where this set is what made that. Okay? Here's an example of something that's not a morphism. Let's say I started with this circle, and everything inside of it, and I wound up with a circle... Uh, that has a big hole in the middle. Well, I done screwed up, right? This has got something else in there. Um, so that's just a, a simple example. Remember that we are preserving the structure of what we started with. So if we start with a nice space, we need to end with a nice space that has the same characteristics. Here's another example. Group. A group is a set G together with an operation star. And the thing about groups is that all elements of a group have inverses, and G is closed under the operation, and the operation star is associative. Okay, so that means that, that if you'll remember, that means that like... Uh, if you write something like this, G3, it's the same thing as writing something like this, where you're multiplying these two together first, or you're multiplying these two together first. It doesn't matter, okay? That's associative. And um, the morphisms here, okay, and we could think about this for just a second. 
or actually maybe we'll just plow through this and go to ring what we need uh, for a morphism from a group into another group or onto another group is we need um, we need to be able to split up the elements okay like this where this is the operation for H and we need the identity element to be mapped uh, to the corresponding identity element in H. So um, let me just walk through this for a second. This again is the structure of a group and this is the morphism of a group. Uh, we call them group homomorphisms. And look what this does. Why do I need these three things? Well, if I have this, look at this closely. That ensures that H, or, or the image of G, is closed under the uh, corresponding operation in H, right? And these two things together, if you think about it for a second, ensure that all of the elements in the image of G have an inverse in H. And those inverses actually correspond to the inverses in G. If I have associativity, I can show that that actually plays through this, that I can show that this operation is associative. And of course, I'm dealing with sets, I'm mapping into sets, so um, I get this as well. And I, and I, I wind up, just by these two things, um, having a map that takes a group and shoves it into another group or onto another group. Okay, now a ring. And if you haven't seen any of these, don't fret about it too much. This is not super important, and these definitions are pretty... Um, a, a good example of a ring is the integers, right? Um, because what you have here is you have an abelian group under addition. In other words, I can take 3 minus 3, and that's 0. Or I could take 3 plus 4, and that's the same thing as 4 plus 3, right? So I have an inverse of 3... Any number I choose, I've got an inverse of, of 3. And I could say this is plus negative 3, to be more precise. Um, and, and the addition is, it doesn't matter which one you do first, which one you put in which direction, right? That's what I mean by abelian. It's commutative, so to speak. It's also closed under addition. If I take any integer, 7, times any other integer, 163, well, I don't know what that is, but it's going to be some integer, right? Um, and, the, and the last thing is that uh, multiplication and addition work together to give us associative and distributive properties. So what could this morphism be? Well, I said that it was an abelian group, so I'm probably going to have something that looks like this. It's abelian group under addition, so that's what I'm looking at here. I'm going to have A plus B is going to be phi of A plus phi of B. Remember, I'm mapping into another ring that's also going to be, uh, is also going to have addition in it. Um, and the identity element of this abelian group is, is zero, right? So I'm, I'm going to need that zero um, maps to whatever the zero is in, in S, if this phi goes from, let's say, R to S. But then I'm also going to need that it's closed under multiplication. And to do that, all I do is, is this right here, right? Or times, I guess. I don't know. Um, so this, it turns out this is all we need. Um, and this, this preserves the structure from R to S, okay? But you can see uh, why this is the way that it is. We selected these things very carefully to make sure that whatever we started with this object here, once we sent it over, sent it through phi, uh, we got an object that was in the same category. And that is the point here, okay? And so finally, we're going to go back to our example of house, and we're just going to, you know, think about what we just did uh, to really, you know, let this settle in. If our object is a house, then the structure of the house is what qualities make our object a house. And morphisms of the house, house morphisms, as we'll call them, are just things you can do to the house that leave it a house. Anything that changes it from a house to something else, 
or that violates these qualities, that's not a morphism. But anything you do to it, that when you're done doing what you're doing, still has all these qualities, that's a house morphism. And that's the idea. It's very simple. You take an object. What makes that object an object? That's its structure. And then the morphisms are just things you can do to the object that leave it with that structure, with the same qualities that made it the object to begin with.